Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Today, I have a really exciting guest, somebody who I've been pestering for a long time and somebody who like I'm I have to say I'm I'm super impressed by how you always came back to me and always responded to me and like really showed an interest in coming on my show. So I'm super honored. Oh, the one and only Sasha Gray. Thank you. This and is no, like, you didn't pester me. I did. I pestered you a couple of times. I try to, because I know how busy one gets. Yeah. So I try to remind you yeah. of my pending request without yes. pestering you. That's totally fine. Because it like, gets I annoying. That. Yeah. Not annoying. At least from you. <laughs> Good. How are you? It's been so long since Good. I've seen you. Yeah, I know. I don't even, I feel like the last time I saw you was probably, if I recall, a bathroom. Really? And I ran into, yeah. I during, thought it was an elevator. Or an elevator. Maybe during an awards show. Yes. Yeah. I think it was the elevator. And it was super brief. Yes, yeah. it was. And you were was very busy, but you yeah. were, you still said hello. Yes. Which is nice. You were kind of one of those people that got really, really famous, but I feel like it didn't change you, which is unusual. Uh, Do you feel like it's, I mean, it must have changed right. you somewhat. Like, obviously you have to become much clearer about setting boundaries and you have to like right. recognize that certain people are after you for certain things and you have to be aware of that. But right. do you still like feel like the same person at all? Oh, I still feel like the same person. So I was just having this conversation with a friend, like, I still feel like I'm 18 sometimes, but then I like look back at, and I'm like, but I've grown and changed so much. Yeah. But I definitely still feel like the same person. I just feel like I'm still learning. I'm still growing and evolving. Yeah. But um, there's always this this sort of idea like you can't be nice. Yeah. And I understand it because I've definitely been taken advantage of by other people or, mm-hmm. or I feel like people have tried to use me in certain ways. Right. Um, but not to the point where it makes me completely resentful and bitter. Mm-hmm. And I've even had people on shoots tell me like, you need to be more of a bitch. I'm like, huh? Like, where does that get you? you yeah. I mean? It's just not, it's not in me. Right. And I actually struggle sometimes because I, I feel like there's times where I should maybe like put that barrier up or right. set that boundary. And right. I'm, I'm such an open-minded and like kind of relaxed person that right. it's hard for me. And so I have to kind of remind myself or hype myself up a little bit sometimes to be like, okay, I'm going into this particular situation. Like, don't let this happen. Right. Don't let that happen. So yeah, right. I, I get it. But um, it's, I would say personally, for sure, it's affected me, but like not in the way I try not to let it affect me in the way I deal with people or interact with people. Right. You're also fortunate. I'm, I'm jealous of you having someone also to like, as like having an agent, you know, mm-hmm. having somebody that can kind of be that person who's like, okay, these are, cause you know, I talked to your agent before mm-hmm. you came on and I, I actually liked being able to like talk to her about like boundaries and rules and all that stuff and not yeah. having to deal with that with you. Yeah. It was kind of nice, you yeah. know, cause then like you and I can just have a good time and Takes like, I know, <laughs> yeah, totally. Because I don't have an agent. So I have to be that person uh, for myself and uh, that's can yeah. be hard for me. Cause I'm the same way. Like I want to, yeah. you know, and I obviously don't have the level of fame that you have whatsoever, but I definitely find myself in situations where I'm nice and then Mm -hmm. I totally regret it Mm -hmm. because this person had, you know, intentions that they did not reveal to me at the beginning. Do you think those are like people that you, people that you actually know or more so? No, like business people. Mm -hmm. Like I get the most insane amount of bullshit business, like proposals, especially now since I started the podcast. I understand. I I bet. I bet you do. Like just... You know, first of all, if someone sends me an email and it doesn't have like a signature with like a company name and like, right. you know what I mean? Like if it's just like, like Tom from his iPhone, right. like I'm just <laughs> not going to respond at this point. It's all in the details. It's all in the details. Do you, sure. can you like, do, do any come to mind as of late, like any bizarre kind of emails or business <gasps> proposals that you've gotten? Or do you have like one that comes up really often like, do people still think that you're in the adult industry and they oh, ask yeah. you to shoot or? Uh, I guess not so much like that. Um, definitely on social media, mm-hmm. people do. And these are just regular people thinking that, like, I go through and read all my messages, which mm-hmm. is impossible. Yeah. Um, 
but occasionally I'll open up my direct messages on any platform of social media and, and immediately like, regret it. Dot, 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 dot. I'm like, okay, delete, 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 delete. Yeah. So, um, but actually professionally speaking, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. I, I, I can't say anything particularly bizarre. Like sometimes my agent will just forward me stuff and be like, look at this one that came yeah. in, you know, and we all laugh about it. But right. I feel like I just get, uh, generally speaking, a lot of questions that were possible opportunities from Russia. Huh. And then nothing ever happens. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting that it's Russia. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a mystery to me. Yeah. But they love me. And I love them. They're hilarious. <laughs> Have you been to Russia? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been all over. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you're like, you're, you're a lot of things. You're a Renaissance woman. You're a DJ. And actually, is that what you would call yourself? A DJ? Or would you give yourself? I'd say like more musician. Musician. I'm okay. more music this past year than okay. I am. I, I'm DJing. really, I mean, yeah, like, I'm really so. ignorant when it comes to the music industry. <laughs> so like, I don't, Me too, don't, you know what I mean? I don't want to be like, you're a DJ and that means one thing and you do something else. I you know what I mean? Um, but I, like I was telling you before we started the podcast, I looked you up a while ago, just like, oh, I wonder what she's doing. Or maybe you posted a link to something and you were playing a show in, I think it was in Mexico. I think maybe Mexico city. Yeah. And it was, was it color. Was it indoors or like colors? It was indoors? outside. Okay. And it no, was fucking huge. Yeah. And the crowd was going insane yeah. for you. And I was like, oh my God. Like I knew that you'd moved on. I, you know, see that you'd like publish books, you know, and I, and I knew that you were doing well, but to see like the scale of your fan base just going crazy for your music, I was, I have to admit, I was really, I was really happy for you. Oh, thank you. I was like, this is so great. This is you know, because we talk a lot in adult <laughs> – I always say that, like, adults, like, the black hole, it's like you have to move faster than the speed of light to get out. Otherwise, the like, force of gravity just pulls you back in. And you, like, got out. Like, and that is something – it's not a success story for everybody. And a lot of people have tried. So, first of all, it's 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 really impressive, your career. Do you know, like – could you say maybe why you feel like you've been able to transcend that? Or is it a mystery to you too? Uh, I mean, partly it's a mystery, mm-hmm. obviously, because I set out with goals of what I wanted to do. And yeah. I thought I would be in the industry a long time. Yeah. A long, like for me, it was a life. Right. That's how I thought of it. And that's how I imagined it and planned it. Um, but I think when I when I try to reflect on it, I think – one of the biggest things is that I was always doing something else. So mm-hmm. I always had other interests. It wasn't the one thing that I relied on. Right. Uh, maybe economically for a while in the yeah. beginning, but I was always doing other things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was always writing and I developed sort of this special relationship with my fans early on. Something that like can't, and I said this a long time ago, I remember saying this a long time ago. I know I can't sustain that forever, meaning you can't sustain that, like, sort of intimate online relationship with fans, whatever that means and whatever that is. Right. But I really did. I spent a lot of time, like, answering fan mail on social media Mm -hmm. and writing blogs and doing all of these things that where I was very interactive with my fan base. Uh, So they, they knew me for porn, but they also knew me for all of these other interests I had. Right. So I think that, I don't know, maybe it gave me a l- more balls yeah. when it was time to leave to be like, okay, I I don't know what's going to happen, but I know that I have all these other things going on so mm-hmm. I can make something work. And I just went for it. You know, I didn't really plan it. And I, when I left, I actually... I didn't even announce it. It wasn't like a declaration. I'm leaving. I'm done with you. It just sort of happened. Yeah. I think you made a final announcement in like, like a couple years after you actually stopped shooting. Like, I think you stopped shooting in like 2009. Yep. And then you made an announcement like maybe 20, I think just to clear the air because people were like, is she or is she? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And that's because I was 
promoting a book and this one journalist in particular during this press tour was like asking very specific questions about the industry or what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And I was just like, whoa. Yeah. It's weird. Uh, for the first time, I found myself unable to answer questions. And also, it didn't feel right mm -hmm. because like how can you – it's – I can't comment on something if I'm not there, if I'm not having those conversations with the industry. You know what I mean? Yeah, like they're looking to you to be the spokesperson for an industry that you're not really involved in anymore. Exactly. And right. I was like, oh, I guess I never really t officially announced it because I didn't feel there was a reason to. Right. Um, because it, I don't regret it either. Right. So right. it just sort of happened. And then I was like, I guess it's time I should make a statement. Yeah. So yeah. that that was kind of my next question. Like, do you have any regrets about being in the adult industry? Um, if you could go back, would, is there anything you would change? I don't think so. No. I think, you know, it's so weird because I remember when I first started, there was makeup artists who would say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? You should charge more money if you're doing that. Mm -hmm. And I, and it was, I guess like, here's the thing. I wasn't doing it for the money. Yeah. But I did enough research before getting into it that I knew, okay, I'm going to have, I'm going to make pretty good money compared to other people my age without a college education. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that going into it, mm -hmm. but it wasn't like everything was a bartering factor for me when yeah. I was doing scenes. And so it was like, I, again, going back to like goals, plans, ideas, why I came into the industry in the first place, it would all mean nothing if I started to say, well, I'm going to charge more for this. Or I'm going to charge more for that. Of course, eventually I did because then my worth grew and then right. I was able to. And that's right. a different story. But right. yeah, overall, I would say like in the industry, no. Yeah. Like, do I like the way certain things played out? No. Mm -hmm. But I can't control that. You right. can't control everything. Right. Um, no. Yeah. Regrets in, in life, yes, yes, but, like, the regret of going into the industry, no, because it gave me so much that I would not have otherwise. Right. So, so much. Right. Yeah. So can I tell you my story about, like, when I first met you? Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you like the little, like, finger thing that I just did? Let me tell you. So I remember your agent, Mark Spiegler, contacting us and being like, I have this girl. She's amazing. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, she And he was so excited because the first scene that you ever did was for Fashionista's uh, Safado, The Challenge. So it was, like, the follow-up yeah. to Fashionista's, which was John Stagliano's, like, monumental film, which made a fuck ton of money. It was, like, a huge... Huge yeah. deal. So, like, to be cast in that, you know, as your very first name was a huge deal. And then he was so excited because I guess you asked Rocco Sofredi to punch you in the stomach. And Mark was so excited about that. And he was like, and she wanted to get punched in the stomach. This girl's gold. I was like, <laughs> okay, Mark. Like, he was so excited. It was really oh funny. God. So you were in the makeup room and I walked in and you were journaling. And you were just sitting there quietly and you were, and you were writing. And this is not something that I normally see. And I was like, oh, hi, like, I'm Holly. Like, what are you doing? And you're like, oh, I'm just like basically journaling and like keeping track of my experiences like in the industry. And I was like, oh, kind of why? <laughs> and then you, I can't remember what exactly you said, but you said something along the lines of how this was going to be experience for you that you were going to like take, keep track of, you know? Yeah. And then I think it was when we did an interview f with you, for Suze Randall's Trash Talk, which was like, that was my dad's idea. I came up with the worst titles for shit. And uh, I was trying to play it before you got here, but my parents haven't converted their videos uh, from WNV, so uh, I can't fucking man. play anything without converting it. But I'm pretty sure in that interview, I asked you, like, what are your dreams and aspirations? And most of the time I get like, oh, I don't know, or we'll see where it goes or whatever. And you were like, I'm here to, like, turn the industry around on its head. And I was like, okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> and you were... Totally fucking right. Like, you came in with this very serious, um, very specific idea of how you – like, you knew what you wanted. Yeah. And you came in and you fucking achieved it. You came in with – you wanted to look at adult a different way and and you did it. And it was like – and I'll never forget that. Like, I was so impressed. I actually want – there was a quote I wrote down that you said um, that – wait, where is it? Oh, here it is. Um, okay. Uh, 
New York Times did an article on you and uh, they described your pornography career as distinguished both by the extremity of what she's willing to do and an unusual degree of intellectual seriousness about doing it. And that was yeah. absolutely you to a T. And I think that you know, the industry has changed so much now and we have so many different kinds of people in. And mm -hmm. I think you're kind of one of the first performers to come in and like intellectualize eroticism. Right. That, and I feel like that hadn't been done before. Uh, well, I all, this is the thing. I just, I go back to being a teenager growing up in a very conflicting, I would say split household mm -hmm. where my mom was very Catholic. Mm -hmm. If I try to ask her about sex, it was like, we're not allowed to talk about that. Like, right. That's discussion for man and wife only. And it's like, come, like, come on. Like, yeah. do you see what we're exposed to? Right. And then my dad, on the other hand, like trying to tell me the blunt, cold, hard truth, which is men only want to use you and fuck you. So be careful. And it's like, yeah. oh, God, what? <laughs> like, what? So uh, I think about that. And then I think about all of this fear that I had before losing my virginity. Mm -hmm. And once I finally did, it was, I, I, this might sound repetitive for people that are fans of me, but it's the truth. It's like a light bulb went off. And I, I shed all this guilt and, and I, try to understand why, why is this there? And, and then I would look towards a lot of people that I admired and realize like a lot of them were men. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think that's uncommon mm -hmm. for my generation. Um, and it made me, I don't want to say like angry, but it sort of inspired me to want to be able to be strong and independent have a voice, have an opinion, but also be sexual mm -hmm. and and unhinged in a in a sort of safe way. You know what I mean? Right. And I say unhinged, but I mean to be able to explore your sexuality without being judged for it. Um, and and in, I in a safe place, like in a, a safe production place. Pla yeah. set is a, a safe, safe place. place to do it. And and I just feel like men are so uh, men have been allowed to do that for so long and mm -hmm. admired for it. Right. Just look at any actor. It's like, oh, they they do this, but they're also ladies' man. You know yeah. what I mean? I'm just like, why can't we be that? Right. Why can't we have that level of equality? So right. that's sort of where I stepped into it, and um, maybe why people think I'm too serious sometimes. But I always joke like, I'm just serious about what I do. Right. But I'm not serious. I don't take myself seriously at all. No, you've got a great sense of humor and you're always like quick to – yeah, I think you come off – I think when people get to know you, you know, That's they, the, they yeah, can I'm see totally that. Different. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and it's true. It's like it, – it's kind of what we were talking about, about like setting boundaries and mm -hmm. things like this or even it depends who I'm around. Some people I'm just more comfortable speaking to mm -hmm. or if I – well, like I said with you earlier, like first of all, we have a history together, but we also right. come from a common place. So I instantly – I'm more free. I'm more relaxed feeling. Good. Um, but to to go back for a second about the Rocco thing. Yes. I did say this. Yeah. But it was improvisational fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean we were so we were fucking or I don't remember exactly how it went down, but we were just talking dirty. Yeah. And he was saying, I want to do this to you. I want to do that. And we were kind of top, we were trying to top each other, trying right. to top each other. Right. And I was just like, oh, man, trying to top Rock and Freddie. That is Bum! that is a goal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it worked. And <laughs> another thing that you that you did, which which you touched on, was that, um, you know, you kind of went and started doing a lot of like the more, quote unquote, extreme acts mm -hmm. um, without like waiting to build a name and then have an opportunity to charge an insane amount of money, which I know back in the day was considered maybe not a good business move because right. you would like shoot yourself out and then like you yeah. would have spent all of your worth, right? Because you're yeah. only worth as much as like your first anal. Yeah. And I think that you really went into it with this idea of like I'm doing this to explore my sexuality yeah. and to push my boundaries in a safe place and it's not about the money. And that was very new mm -hmm. for a lot of people and – that is something that has changed lately. Like there's a lot of girls that come in now and like want to start doing extreme stuff right away. Like Angela White's a great example. Yeah. I don't know. Have you ever met Angela? I have, yeah. I just okay. had dinner with her like three weeks ago or something. I was going to say yeah. you two would really like each other. Yeah. I feel because you're both incredibly intelligent. I feel like you have a similar mindset. Yeah. She's like a huge star right now. Yeah. She's, She's a wonderful – like 
performer of the year three three times. Yeah, I think so. Row? Yeah, I mean, and Insane. she deserves it. Like yeah. that girl, and she's wonderfully and humble. I mean, yeah. it's funny. I actually made a joke the other day on Twitter, and I was like, I should just call my podcast "Everybody Loves Angela White" because, yes. like, I feel like <laughs> her name comes up all the time, and everybody just loves her. So, and I know she listens to this podcast. So, Angela, we love you. Anyways, <laughs> um, but yeah, so I feel like that this, this idea now that coming into porn is a place where one can explore their sexuality. Someone can push their boundaries, Mm -hmm. can even use it as a platform Mm -hmm. to talk about like progressive ideas, sexual, social, all of that was, was never something that anybody entertained back in the day. It was always like, come in and make as much money as you can. And then like, get out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think that it, it's great that this is happening. Mm -hmm. I love seeing it. I love reading about it. But I was at at this dinner I was at a few weeks ago. I was, um, it was a group dinner. So actually Rocco was there Mm -hmm. and we were talking about similar topics, similar subjects. And we did recognize though, there is this sort of, I don't want to say danger, like Mm -hmm. warning, but there's, (sighs) there seems to be this trend, but I don't feel like the people that are, all of the people that are coming into the business with this mindset really understand what it means. Mm-hmm. And they don't think about the repercuss- repercussions or, you know, how their life will change right. and it, it, after doing this. And that's something that I was hyper aware of mm-hmm. getting into it. Like I knew it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. You can, and you can never prepare for it. Even if you know it's going to happen, you can never prepare for like right. the emotions that just come with it. Right. Um, the constant need to be on defense. Like, yeah. You can't prepare for that. And I just, I think because, uh, especially because of social media, you have all of these sort of Insta fames Mm -hmm. with hot girls. Mm -hmm. And I was joking, like, I think six years ago, I was saying, there's no need for a Playboy anymore because there's Instagram. Right. You know, why pay for it? Right. It's it's actually better because it feels more real. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, Playboy get sold off. Now they're only doing fully clothed things. Like they had to change their entire business model. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like there's this sort of inherent need in narcissism. Mm-hmm. That's really dangerous right now. And people are not, and, and this is like, let's just say, forget about porn. Yeah. The internet. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. internet. Yeah. Take porn out of the freaking equation. Like it's the internet. People are, looking for this, these things. And like, I'm watching girls in a club a couple weeks ago, smoke weed on camera. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not a moralist necessarily. I don't have anything against that. But like, you're putting that on the internet. Look at, look at politics right now. Like, yeah. I don't know. So some, yeah, I don't know. I think I know people, you- I think people just, they're not like, they want the attention that comes with so much. But they and don't I, want to deal with repercussions. Yeah. Or they're not aware of it. You yeah. know, they don't even think about it. Yeah. It's not important. Yes. And I and I actually I think a lot of that also goes back down goes down to like where we're at as a society. Mm-hmm. And this I feel it everywhere. Mm. The level of desperation. People are working multiple jobs. People are graduating college and they can't get a job or they can't get into college because they can't afford it. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these things I think really do have an impact on us. So it's so easy to let ourselves go and get lost in social media because yeah. it's a distraction yeah. and it feels good. Yeah. So I think, I, I don't think it's, um, I'm not being judgmental when I say any of this. It's mm-hmm. just like an observation and a reflection of what's happening in society. And you see how it all, for me, it all ties together. It all makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. How these things are happening. Yeah, we talk, I mean, social media comes up so much as one of the great, like, it's it's both a good and a bad thing. Yeah. It's such a double-edged sword. Yep. Um, the way that it's allowed what people in the adult industry to band together, like, you know, the Me Too movement. Yeah. And it's it's had its time in the adult industry as well. And, and now women can call out, you know, predatory directors and, and all of that and have other people come forward and they can, yeah. like, help each other out. But also, too, exactly what you said – getting lost in Instagram and looking at these other people's facades of their life Mm -hmm. because that's not what their life is actually Mm -hmm. like. And then feeling this constant need to achieve 
mm-hmm. all of these unrealistic things. I mean, I find myself caught in that all the time. Yeah. Like I do a million different things because I'm crazy. Um, but I'll see somebody doing, you know, somebody who's got, who's doing one particular thing. Maybe they're just directing, you know what I mean? Right. Like I'm directing right. and I've got a podcast and I, do I do anything else? I think that's all I do. Anyways, <laughs> but you know what I mean? And, and I see this person achieve this and I'm like, that should be me. Yeah. I should be doing that, you know, <laughs> or I see somebody doing really well with their podcast. I should be doing like, <laughs> like all of the things, you know, I feel like why well, I haven't achieved and it can make me feel like really terrible yeah. about myself yeah. and, and I, and getting lost in getting lost in that scrolling, like it's yep. fucking, and we don't talk to each other anymore. <laughs> you know, like one of the great things about this podcast for me, one of the greatest gifts is sitting down with somebody and talking to them eye to eye for an hour yeah. without my phone distracting me, right. without checking my emails, without checking my text messages. Like, you know, I started this because I was in a place where I didn't know where my business is going. I had a really bad year and I was like, well, fuck it. I'll just try a podcast. But beyond the fact that it's been more successful than I imagined it would be, just the gift of giving me the opportunity to have conversations with interesting yeah. people, I feel is like I'm so grateful for that. Yeah. And definitely. I feel like people are really looking for that. They're looking for that connection. connection. A connection. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's hard to find. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to find, yeah. I mean, I find myself in situations, all like social situations all the time, where people are, they're actually so disconnected and it's mm-hmm. almost like they don't know how to socialize. And I'm not saying I'm like, I'm not a great socializer. Yeah. Definitely not. It doesn't come naturally to me, but it doesn't mean I don't try. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean I don't try. You yeah. have to keep trying. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend, she's actually a friend of a friend and she's younger and, you know, grew up with social media and she literally like can't have a conversation with you unless it's on Snapchat. It's really bizarre. Like to talk to her and have a conversation with her one on one is like, like she can't look you in the eye. It's really strange. Yeah, it like has to be on Snapchat for you guys to talk, and then and then like she it's can. Not real. Yeah. It's not on the snap. Right. Exactly. Whoa. And I fight that too. I mean, do you do you find that you struggle with that? You're like, I need to document this experience. Oh no. Absolutely. You, you're able to like be in it. Yeah. I'll like, I understand that it's there and it's a necessity. So if I go to a show, I'll take, I'll record a little bit of video, mm-hmm. but then I'll put my phone away. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my stomach growling. Sorry. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> <didn't hear> <laughs> um, I try not to actually, I purposely mm-hmm. try not to. And now I'm, I'm like, I carry a camera a lot though. Mm-hmm. So I actually find myself documenting other people more than myself. Right. But on camera, not on the phone. I actually try to like, especially during lunches or dinners, like that's yeah. a sacred time for yes. me, in my opinion. Yes. Um, again, like you're saying here, like we're sitting here having a conversation without our phones. Like right. I feel the same way about eating with people. Like yeah. you need that in yeah. your life. And so sometimes, yeah, I understand like this is a funny moment. I should grab it. Yeah. And then boom, p- instantly put the phone away. Yeah. I just realized the irony also too of what I said about – um having this opportunity to sit down and have a conversation with somebody because I am recording we still it rely on so us. people like, can watch it right. on their phones. Right. So I just, yes, I but recognize again, the irony of that statement. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Um, so going back to just your early career and adult, uh, when you first like broke into the industry and you were, you know, super popular, people were saying you were going to be like the next Jenna Jameson. Did that bug you that, like comparison. Cause I feel like a lot of people say that, like she was the mm-hmm. own, the last big porn star mm-hmm. and she was like the epitome of what one, the like the height of fame that one can reach. And I just feel like right. it's a strange, you're so different than her. Right. And like the trajectory of your lives are so different right. that I feel like that's kind of a stupid comparison to make, but did you hear that a lot? I did. And I felt like that was coming from people outside of the industry. Yeah. Cause people who don't know the industry, they're like Jenna Jameson. Yep. That's the industry. Yep. She's everything that we think porn is. She's got big fake tits. She's got yep. blonde hair and she wears a lot of makeup. It, and that was the exact opposite of what exact I, opposite of you, what I was doing. Right. So it bothered me a little bit, mm-hmm. but I also understood like, okay, I started, I didn't, let's not say I understood then, but I was beginning to understand like why people say those sorts of things. And I feel like if I have to look back on it, there's, it could have been far worse. Like <laughs> you, they could have said worse. Um, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's just like, well, no, are you paying attention? Yeah. Are you actually hearing me? 
Are you actually listening to what I have to say? Or are you just trying to get a sound bite? Or are you just trying to put this tagline out there? So, yeah, yeah and so, I guess in some ways, yeah, it did bother me. Mm-hmm. I mean, even the the choices that you made, and I, actually I don't know how much of a choice you had in it in, in this, in the content that that you created. So your penthouse shoot with Terry Richardson. Yeah. Was that your decision or did they somehow, because that was a very you shoot, but it was so not a penthouse shoot. Oh yeah. At all. It looked really weird in yeah. that magazine, but it made sense for you, but it didn't make sense for the brand. Right. So I actually sought Terry out when mm-hmm. I was 18 mm-hmm. and I like found an email for him and his assistant wrote me back. It was like, yeah, next time we're in LA, we'll hit you up. And then Boom, like I went and shot with him. So we actually, we were pretty friendly during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And um, a woman actually that worked for Penthouse approached me Mm -hmm. and got a hold of me. And she was like, hey, I want to do a shoot with you. And I don't want to say this for sure, but if if my memory serves me correctly, she saw the photos I did with him. Okay. And wanted to do something for Penthouse. Right. I think that's what went down. But, like, I met this woman um, at the Roosevelt. She was like, let's meet by the pool. And, you know, so she's like, I'm fucking serious. L.A. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so, so LA. Let's meet at the Roosevelt and talk about your shoot with yeah. Terry Richardson. <laughs> and she actually said, you know, like, I – she actually wanted to do something different. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what she wanted to do for the magazine. I think she was kind of new to the brand. And um, so, yeah, they sought me out. And, um, and afterwards she said <laughs> – I think she said they were pretty pissed off at her <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and that like he, well we don't own the photos what's that about and I was like do you think like didn't Helmut Newton shoot for Penthouse maybe I was like do you think Helmut Newton gave them the rights and I'm not saying like comparing the two but especially during this period of time like this is the height of Terry's career yeah, yeah I seriously like, doubt doing, that they could have paid you know him enough I mean? to no, exactly. give yeah so that's kind of funny. <laughs> that is funny. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, okay. So, so you're in porn. You're getting a lot of mainstream attention. You end up on the Tyra Banks show. Yes. How did that go? You know what? Let's take a quick commercial break. All right, Ernie. <laughs> and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the Tyra Banks show. All right. Are you a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered? Of course you are. Well, I need your help to keep this show going. This is why I've set up a Patreon account where you can donate to support my show. And in exchange, you can be eligible for all kinds of cool, fun perks and prizes, which include autographed DVDs and books. See, guys, she's actually signing shit. Free membership passwords to my website, hollyrandall.com. Free mugs, pens, shirts, bags, all kinds of really cool stuff. So take care of me and I will take care of you. I will not only be able to continue to produce this podcast with really awesome, inspiring content about your favorite adult stars, but I will also give back to you in terms of all the cool, fun perks and prizes that we offer. So please, please support me at patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. And thank you guys so much for your support. I could not do this without you. All right. So Tyra Banks. Oh, Smi- yeah. Smize, what did she say? Smize, smile with your eyes, right? Uh, smile with your eyes? Yeah, I think that was did her thing like it? on Project Runway. Wait, what did eyes. she do? No, model, uh, best top model. Top next, America's wow. Next top model? America's Next Top Model. Yes. I am okay. really up on my Tyra Banks fucking trivia. I know so much about her. <laughs> um, so Sweeps Week is a thing for people watching this if they don't know what that is. Okay. It's... And I don't know if it's still such a prevalent thing just because the way uh, television has changed Mm -hmm. and we have streaming services and all this. So Mm -hmm. it's like a constant feeding of the machine in terms of content. But before all of these things were as big as they are now, Sweeps Week in TV, I think it happens maybe twice a year or four times a year, I forget. It's when the producers of shows are on an absolute edge to get the best and highest ratings they possibly can. Okay. And, like, their jobs depend on it, right? Mm-hmm. So somebody – I've never heard of this before, and I, I'm so stupid that I literally thought you were talking about, like, a sweepstakes. 
Like that yeah, every, that every year people do like a big like Oprah does with the like look under your chair and everyone gets a car. Sorry, okay. Uh, no, just okay. let me just broadcast. I actually don't my know ignorance. why they call it that either. Like, it probably want no to sweep clue. the ratings. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, um, sorry. Go on. So somebody had read an article that I did, um, and said like, "Oh, we should get this girl on." Mm-hmm. And I spent I don't and I had also done like some other prime time sort of sensationalized interviews. I think things you did like, like Inside Edition. Yeah, right? yeah, I did yeah. that too once. Um, and they said, okay, we should get this girl on, and they spend time with you before. Mm-hmm. It's really psychological. Yeah, it's incredibly psychological. They get you to trust them. No, they no? want like informational. They're just okay. like. As a good journalist would, but they, in this case, and in some cases, just to use it against you, mm. to try and prepare themselves. Like, they'll prepare themselves, but you're not allowed to prepare. Right. So, God forbid I would ever ask for questions. Right. Right? Right. Um, so, I spent time with them before leading up to it. Um, I think we shot some, like, random B-roll footage for them to use. I think they came on set. They did a fake thing in their own wardrobe room where we film like as if I was getting ready to go do a scene mm-hmm. um, with makeup artists that are not even in the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and the day of, everything was stalled. So it's like you need to be there at 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Not knowing the show doesn't film till like, I don't remember, between 12 and 2. You know what I mean? Like yeah. why is it necessary? Then they isolate you. Mm-hmm. They isolated me. Um, oh my God, it I sounds had like an interrogation. Three people. It, it is like a, it's a psychological interrogation. One hundred percent. I had three people with me, and they separated us. And I came with a shirt. Uh, I came with a shirt that I did like iron on letters. It said "Tuva bien." Mm-hmm. Like everything's all right. Yeah. And they said, "Okay, we're going to wardrobe now." I said, I'm in my wardrobe. What do you mean? Like, no, no, we have wardrobe for you. So they, then they take you to wardrobe. They dress me in a pinker than pink than this top, which like, it's especially so, that is so, so not color. Yeah, yeah, so my color. <laughs> they put me in these like really terrible jeans with hush puppies. And hush puppies are like those really ugly brown ballet flats. I haven't heard that name, Hush Puppies, in like 10 years. It's the thing, right? And <gasps> oh my God. they even made me take my earrings out. They straightened my hair and slicked it back so much, like to make me look young. Like yeah. this is the whole thing. Like make her look as uh, innocent as possible. Make her look confused. Yeah. And this, I would say, I had done some big interviews. I already had a distrust at this point. Mm-hmm. But I still didn't have the balls to stand up for myself. Like right. if that was today, that would that would never happen. And it has happened where people are like, you can't wear that. I'm like, yeah, Why? yeah. <laughs> you know, like, no, absolutely not. Right. Um, or people want to dress me in certain things for photo shoots. I'm like, no, that's not me. Like, I don't yeah. want to wear that. Right. Um, anyways, uh, so it's it's a complete psychological process. She never came out and introduced herself beforehand. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's normal on talk shows or not. Yeah. Um, I thought it was weird at the time, at least. I still think it's weird. Um, separated me from the three people that I brought with me. The one funny thing is I requested banana Laffy Taffy's in my, cause they were like, do you have a writer? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was just like banana Laffy Taffy. And I, it was a joke and they actually yeah. did it. I was like, Oh, one thing they did that was kind. Um, and then we get on set. Oh, The last thing about the wardrobe is that I said, I'm not wearing these shoes. I actually did say that. I was like, Mm -hmm. I'm not, I I can't wear these shoes. These are terrible. And they said, oh, the camera's not going to see him though. So it's no big deal. Uh, Like, why did I believe this? Why? You know what I mean? Because you want to inherently believe that people aren't full of shit. And these are wardrobe people. But then the producer's standing, standing by and looking at everything. And like, I've been on other talk shows since then and it doesn't go down like this. Mm -hmm. So. All, all definitely planned and put together. And then uh, when we're actually filming, um, I look up and realize, like, oh, there's five cameras. 
from mm-hmm. every direction, mm-hmm. from every angle. So, of course, they're going to see the full thing, right? The she comes puppies. out. Yeah, the hush puppies. <laughs> no. <laughs> destroying, no, my, destroying my image. <laughs> <laughs> she comes out dressed like a school madam. Oh, yeah. Like, the whole thing is set up. You know wow. what I mean? And even if the public doesn't recognize these things, like, yeah. subconsciously they do. Like, yeah. you're taking that in and it's going to affect the way you're viewing this thing. Of course. Um, at certain points during the interview, she did. She was stumped. I stumped her multiple times. Multiple times. And she would say, I am so emotional right now. We're going to have to pause and take a quick break. And there's, like, 30 people in the background, right. producers, PAs, all these people, and they would run over and, okay, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And they did get me with one line. Like, I don't remember what it was. If I went back and watched it, I would remember the moment. But they did get me to, like, they feed you lines, right? And they right. were trying to do that. And I think something just might have snapped in me where, I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to use that one. But mm-hmm. they told her what to say in reply. Like, So, I mean, all of these things are set up. Um, and then the end result, what do they do? They pair me up with um, this sort of non-sex positive feminist. We would call who, them a swap now, sex exclusionary. Oh, there's a term for Oh, there's it. a okay. whole term for okay. it. It's a, yeah, like sex worker exclusionary, no, swerf. Sex worker exclusionary radical feminist. Okay. Exactly. Swerf. These these people. Um, she, I think, did like four porn scenes mm-hmm. and somehow had an authority to speak. Do you remember her name? No. She was, I was 18 when I did the show and I think she was in her 30s at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they brought on a 15-year-old 15 year, 15 streetwalker prostitute. And this is the narrative that they try to yeah. tell. Yeah, that of course. We're, we're all the same. We all come from the same background. It's evil. It's bad. They're damaged. Mm-hmm. And so then the girl, the older woman served as the uh, the person that was trying to warn me. And then the younger girl was just there as a shock factor. So that was the whole, how the whole thing went down. And I did – I remember I did like a YouTube vlog about it afterwards. Like the magic of editing, they cut – because they have five cameras. Right. All they have to do is cut to me listening – Mm-hmm. And therefore, I have no response to her questions, like the power of right. editing. Yeah. And so in a lot of it, I just looked silent. But luckily, uh, one of the people that I brought there was Peter Warren. Ah. And Peter Warren actually like wrote. So Peter uh, Warren is like, uh, I don't know, what's his role? He's a, he's an AVN. Is he yeah. Like head editor or something like that. So anyway, it's just yeah. for the general public doesn't know who he is. And um I think he had actually asked me, like I told him I was going on, and he actually asked me, can I shadow you or something like this? And mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, why not? And like, thankfully, he was there because he actually watched the entire thing as it went down. And um, and he wrote about it afterwards, like just saying how twisted and manipulative mm-hmm. the entire thing was. And I did a vlog about it. But yeah, it exists. It's there. Um, it happened. Yeah. I, I mean. What you going to do? But it's still it, – you know that old saying, like, no, pre- no, there's no such thing as bad press. I do think there is, but, yeah. like, in that case, would I do it again? Yes, I would still do it again. <laughs> yeah? I would still do it again. Yeah. Would you do anything differently? Oh, for sure. Like, I wouldn't have You wouldn't wear those that, hush puppies. I uh, wouldn't have worn the hush puppies. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that line that they fed me. Right. You know what I mean? Do you don't remember what it was? No, it was something really reactionary, though, and yeah. that's just not my style. Right. Um, typically. But that's got to be so frustrating, and this is why so many people in the adult industry are so wary of mainstream coverage because they oh, come yeah. in with an agenda. Oh yeah, and they really want you to fit into this, you know, preconceived notion that they have of yep. you and the industry, and they'll find like whatever way that they can to make you look whatever way they want you to look. Right, and it's really irritating. It really is, yeah, and it, and that's one of my gripes about just where we are in society and the news cycles, the media, social media, Mm -hmm. everyone has a voice and it feels and appears like on the surface that so much is changing and so much is happening, but it's still so slow. And I still feel like even though I'm not in the industry anymore, just looking at it from a sort of a surface level point of view, I still don't feel like the industry is being respected. Yeah. At all. 
yeah. by these people that consider themselves progressive. Right. You know, the, the, the adult industry is completely left out of the equation in mm-hmm. so much of the coverage about, like, Me Too, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, or when people are telling their stories or sharing their stories with, quote, unquote, mainstream media. And I fucking hate that term. I really do. Yeah. But, um, you then, want to just call it fake news? It's, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like, if there's one thing I can agree with him on... <laughs> That, not for the same reasons, but I understand. Um, yeah, I, I think that it's still like I still take that personally. Like I look mm. at it and it's like, why can't a positive story be told ever, ever? Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and let's just say um, not just it's like if they can't find something bad to say, they're just going to hypersexualize everything about being with you yeah or like making these assumed observations and projections onto you and then writing about that i remember doing an article um and they asked me one question about like vr porn Mm -hmm. and i answered how i felt and then that was like the headline of the article Mm. i was just like that was not the point of this yeah but that's what's gonna sell and that's what's gonna sell you know and it's so stupid because at the end of the day i really don't care that much (laughs) like (laughs) i hate this thing where they take one sentence and make it appear as if like this is I have a firm stance on this and this mm-hmm. is how I feel like mm-hmm. I really don't care that much yeah <laughs> don't, yeah. don't make it look like I do I right. don't like that like let's talk about something else yeah 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 um so let's talk about something else let's talk about uh your role in the girlfriend experience yeah that was a huge deal yeah because you know this whole like crossover into mainstream idea for people in porn was first of all not very popular and then the first person who was heralded with it was uh jenna jameson Mm -hmm. because she did zombie strippers (laughs) i'm sorry but you know what i mean yeah so when you were doing like a soderberg film that was like a big difference. I would also like to take this opportunity just quickly to say, because nobody ever talks about it, but I think one of the greatest crossover into mainstream uh, porn stars is Sonny Leone. Oh, yeah. In Bollywood. But no, we oh, never yeah. talk about it because we don't understand Bollywood. We don't know Bollywood. Right. It's not our world. But that girl has fucking killed it. Oh, like, yeah. It's insane. Yep. And I'm super proud of her. She actually doesn't like, same thing as you. She doesn't regret her time in the porn industry. She, she, you know, like we're still friends. Yep. We don't like talk all the time, but I've worked with her on some projects and, um, anyways, so she, but like no one ever talks about it, but besides her in like yeah. our arena, I feel like you're one of the prime examples of somebody who's been successful there. So yeah, I feel like people forget that or it's sort of out of sight, out of mind yeah, when just, it comes to her. Yeah, it's totally. Like, but look at what she's doing. Yeah. It's insane. It's insane. Um, and India is not a small place. <laughs> no. She's got like, I don't know, fuck, 20 million followers on Instagram. I mean, some insane. Whoa. I mean, she Whoa. goes into airports and it's like, yeah. I mean, I, her husband Daniel has sent me like video of people like, it's just the people like got their babies. Like they give her babies. Like the Pope. Yes. I swear <laughs> to fucking God. It's crazy. <laughs> fucking India loves and hates her. Right. Like it's, right. it's crazy. It's amazing. But anyways, um, just very happy for her success. But back to you. Uh, so so this was a big deal. Where, how did you feel when you were approached for this role? Uh, well, I thought it was fake at first. Because <laughs> I bet you did. It, it happened through MySpace. So many things <laughs> happened through MySpace. So many things. Oh, MySpace. And one of his producers and um, collaborators, who's also a writer, Brian Koppelman, contacted me asking, like, would you be interested in meeting Steven? It was like a very brief message. Would you be interested in meeting him to discuss a possible film project? I'm like a huge fan of his, mm-hmm. but it's my space. And I said, well, if you don't mind, can you please have him call me and leave me a message if I don't answer? So I know this is real. Yeah. And sure enough, like within the week I came home and there was a voicemail cause I saw it a house phone. There was like a voicemail from him. And I was like, Oh, it's real. Like it's, he has a recognizable voice. Yeah. Um, and that makes sense. So that's why it's funny when I get – when we talked earlier about like those fake business proposals. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and you ask them to like prove themselves. Right. And they get really angry about that. If yeah. they're legit, like they're happy to do so because they understand exactly. that people intimi- intimidate – imitate them all right. the time. 
Right, yeah. Oh, catfishing is a real thing. Yeah. Um, so when it happened, it was just strange because I met with him, and I think he was going to shoot Oceans, the last of the Oceans movies or something like oh, that. 11, 13, 13, maybe. I, and, um, I haven't seen any of them. Oh, okay. <laughs> and he was like, uh, I, I want you to be a little bit older because I think I was – I was either 18 turning 19 or had just turned 19. And he mm-hmm. was like, yeah, like we need to wait a year or two. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, okay, okay. But during that period, we would communicate by email. We met a few times and I would ask him questions and he asked me to like keep a journal, um, a specific journal. And um, it was a really, I would have to say, bizarre experience. Yeah. Because I, I definitely – at the beginning, especially, sort of felt like I was in a fishbowl. Mm-hmm. You know, I felt I felt I was being treated differently, not disrespected, but being treated differently. Mm. Um, like we got to keep an eye on her. You know what I mean? Like um, what you might go blow ageism. the sound man. Yeah, I don't know. It's like ageism. Like let's make sure she doesn't go crazy, or you know, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. That's just kind of the mood I got. Like, but you know, I get it. Movies cost money. You need to protect what's going on. So I get it. But I think it's possible they thought that I was like a party animal or something. I don't know. Which I don't Um, think you've ever been. No. No. Um, At home, yes. (laughs) (laughs) But um, anyways, the experience was the first three days were nerve wracking. I bet. Because it was so quiet on set. So quiet on set that it made me uncomfortable. Interesting. And I didn't know how to deal with that silence. And nowadays it's like I crave that. Um, mm. But, yeah, then I then I understood, okay, no, this is just how he wants this set to function. Mm-hmm. And then I, you know, then I understood it. I respected it. Um, but it was a really interesting experience. Everything was improvised. Like we, like I said, we would have these discussions and sometimes he would give me a prompt like, okay, just make sure you say this at one point during mm-hmm. the scene and then go with the rest. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would just ask him like, okay, what's my goal? What's my intention here? And uh, that's how the shoot went down. I think we shot it in like two weeks more or less. Um, and then it still took a while for it to come out. But yeah, it was a good, it was a great experience. And then I felt like I was doing a year a year of press. I was going to ask you what the media was, was like afterwards. It was weird. Yeah. It was really weird. Um, parts of it were enjoyable mm-hmm. for sure, but it was really hard to balance because it's like you're not, you know, it's it's the nature of the beast. Like I'm not getting paid to do these things, but mm-hmm. it took up so much of my time, mm-hmm. so much of my time, and I and I felt like, I just got incredibly bored talking about myself all the time. And people are probably <laughs> asking you the exact same the questions. The exact same questions. What I was the one that, question that you got asked the oh, most? Man. I don't know. I would say the most generic and kind of stupid one though, would be, what's the main difference between performing in porn and performing on a set with Soderbergh? Which like, <laughs> <laughs> fucking obvious, man. Yeah. It's obvious. Yeah. Um, that's like one that immediately comes to me. Um, I guess the question of feminism too, mm. that came up a lot. Like, Do, do you, you get consider- a lot of that like, do you consider porn degrading to women? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, the, which I already had my stance on. And at the time, like the term white feminism didn't exist. Mm-hmm. And I wish it did because mm-hmm. it's like, okay, we have a definition of what that is, at mm-hmm. least like a broader understanding culturally of mm-hmm. what that is and why I never felt like I fit into it. And nowadays I can say I consider myself a postmodern feminist okay. because I don't fit into that ideal. But like the feminism that I saw around me didn't – it didn't include people like me. Mm-hmm. And that's why I didn't want to be associated with it. Right. And it was so hard for people to understand that. Like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, they might be sex positive – until you talk about porn. Right. Right. Because it's that whole idea of, you know, and uh, I've talked about this so many times and this makes me so mad. But when, when you ask that idea, that question, it's you're inherently putting the woman in the place of the victim. You're suggesting she exactly. has no exactly. – she can't make her own decisions. She exactly. can't possibly be an openly sexual woman, uh, an exhibitionist. Like, exactly. She can't enjoy these things because women can't be those things. Right. Women can only be one thing. Yep. And they can't be anything 
men can be this way and women can be this way and this is how it is. Right. If women are this way, then they must be being forced into it. Like it just – you take away the power of a, f- a woman's choice. Yeah, when you say that, hundred percent. And I just want to punch people. I it makes me so mad. I still have friends that come to me and say, "Oh, my friend who you met, my this person who you met. You remember that person?" They ask me, "So what happened to her?" Oh, right. <laughs> all what? the time, like yeah. now, today. It just happened yeah. a week ago. Like it happens all the time. I bet. It's. Yeah, it's frustrating. But I, I don't know. I, I, and the thing is, it's like we all have stories about, like, none of us have perfect childhoods. None of us have had a perfect right. life. So we all have stories that make us who we are. But that right. doesn't necessarily, it's not the precursor for, like, getting into porn. Exactly. Like, I know accountants who've had horrible childhoods. Right. You know what I mean? Like, so, Yeah. I mean, it's just like, but, you know, people always want, this is, this is what I think the issue is, is that people so often see everything through the lens of their own experience. Exactly. They cannot imagine because they feel something about a certain thing. They can't exactly. imagine that somebody else could feel a different way. Right. So they're like, well, I would be so ashamed and disgusted to do this thing. So yeah. therefore this person must inherently feel that way. Right. And they must have been forced into this by some other means because everybody must experience things the way that I experience it. Right. Because I only see things through my own eyes. Exactly. It's yeah, it's a projection. Yeah. Um, I was talking about this with a friend like a week ago. I was catching up with who has nothing to do with the adult industry, actually. Mm -hmm. But we were having this conversation of trying to make new friends as you get older. and Which is so hard. And people often say, like, are you jaded? I don't consider myself jaded at all. I feel like I'm just an incredibly open-minded and experienced individual. Mm -hmm. And you meet people and you realize that taking even, like, porn or sex out of the equation, a lot of people just, they they don't have a lot of life experience. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think that's sort of what separates that school of thought from yes. people who are in the industry and have, you know, a healthy relationship with it. Right. Right. Yeah, I know that totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. Um, so you then put out a photo. Well, no, actually you got into music first. Yes. Right? Well, I was I, like I said, I was doing all of these things at the same time. So I was like taking pictures on set really early on. Right. And – um. It was, a, yeah, like a few years in the process of making that, actually. Um, quite a few years. So how did and you then, get into music? And was that something that you were doing before you got into the industry? Or is that something that you started to experiment while you were in it? I experimented before getting into the industry, but it always, always, always goes back to writing for me. Mm-hmm. So I started writing poetry when I was like 10. Mm-hmm. And then sh- short stories when I was like 13. Mm-hmm. So I think that for me was just a natural progression into it and sort of looking at some of my heroes who were Renaissance artists themselves, you know, mm-hmm. and saying like, yeah, I can do that. Why not? Like, where was that when I was actually 13? You know, like I could have yeah. used, I could have used those, ins- these figures as inspiration mm-hmm. then um, and didn't discover them until later. Yeah. I mean, to me, it feels like you're just very much an artist and you want to explore art in all different kinds of ways. Mm-hmm. You know, in sex, in yeah. photography, in writing, in music. Mm-hmm. Um, and you actually, there was a quote that you said in 2009. Do you like my little research? I don't normally do this for people, by the way. You're very special. Um, on porn, you said, uh, I don't want to segregate it from art because to me it's art. I think a lot of people don't look at it that way, but I do. Yeah. And I think that that makes sense to me. And I think back when you were in the industry that was like less of a thing, you know, yeah. Gonzo was really big back then. Yeah, and yeah. Like lots of really extreme acts, which, you know, can be art to certain people. Like yep. what your body can do yeah. is kind of amazing. Um, but now I've se- there's such like a growth in the adult industry, yeah. which is so cool. And different people are doing all kinds of different stuff. There's a lot more women directing. Yeah, and, for sure. Yeah. And there's people like Caden's making these incredible movies, Caden Cross, and then Erica Lust is doing a lot of stuff and then Brie Mills. And so like yeah. we have all these really like different artistic forms of pornography, which has just made – the entire industry just flourished so much and right. it's just diversified a lot. And I think it's a really great time for us. Yeah. And, um, I don't know. Is there like a part of you that, I don't know, not necessarily maybe wishes that you were in it now, but 
feels like. Well, for sure, the production value has gone up. Yeah. And it's like, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you're yeah, like actually, this is yeah. what I was advocating yeah. for back then. Yeah. And then, yeah. For sure, yeah. It's it's really cool to see the change. And I think that's actually one of the positive things about social media, too, is yes. like, well, I think porn has always been a trendsetter in mainstream media, mm-hmm. and it never gets the credit for it. Yeah. But I think that is one of the really positive things, is that people um, can inspire each other mm-hmm. through these different mediums. Mm-hmm. And now, like technology is much cheaper than it was as well. So you're yeah. able to do so much more with with less, which right. is really cool. Right. Yeah. And I just remembered one thing. I don't know why that – no, I do know why I was dream, imagining a set. I do have one regret of porn. Okay. It's a person I went into business with, and that's it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's all. Yeah. Did you like – oh, wait. Did you start an agency? Yeah. It didn't live. Yeah. Dude, those are tough. It was not worth it. No. It was a disaster. It's actually one of the hardest jobs. Yeah. Is being a porn agent. You're a full-time babysitter. (laughs) Absolutely not. This is absolutely true. Why did I think this was a good idea? (laughs) What, um, speaking of agents, do you talk to Spiegler anymore at all? I do, yeah. I actually, I had dinner with him, the same dinner a couple weeks ago, like him, Angela Rocco, um, and a group of other people. What was your experience with Mark Spiegler like? Always super good. Always yeah. positive. Um, of course, when you first meet him, you have preconceived notions like, mm-hmm. uh, who is this guy? But <laughs> his t shirts don't help. <laughs> he I, always wears a shirt that has some like really cro- like cr- crass thing on it. But uh, it's funny because all the, his girls buy them in these shirts. Oh my goodness. Like one of my favorites is stay in school. You're too ugly to be a whore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you walk around looking like Mark Spiegler wearing a shirt it, like that. It. He, he owns does it. own it. And then you meet him and he's actually one of the – he's kind in a gruff kind of way. Right. No bullshit way. But he cares. He genuinely cares he really about does. his girls. Like one of the most touching things I remember I saw, we were at the x Awards and we were all like kind of walking – to our table and you know he always gets a table for all the speaker girls and he had this big bag of like food and like candy and all this kind of stuff and I was like what is that and he was like oh I bring food for the girls because these awards always go on too long and they don't serve food and I don't want them to get hungry wow and I was like oh and he yeah. brings pastries to set all the time yeah which is he always brought food to set yeah he still does it and I curse him because yeah, like, like I'm always on an imaginary diet yeah but like they are also delicious pastries and I eat them all and then hot I hate dogs. myself like I actually can't eat hot dogs but fries yes oh, yeah he doesn't do that now it's pastries okay I think they keep better um, yeah yeah no he was all you know we always had a really good relationship and actually when I um when I was looking for an agent, he was the first person that picked up the phone. Yes, he always picks up the phone. I had him on my podcast, and he was like, oh, I'm, really? I'm picking up the phone while we're yeah, doing yeah. this. He's like, wow. just so you know, I'm taking calls. Wow. And I was like, you do you, Mark. Yeah. And 100%, like two phone calls came oh, while he goodness. was on the show. And I was like, well, yeah, this is Mark. It's his life. <laughs> yeah. But I, it, it, you just a lot of things that I do are based or – yeah, based on instinct. Mm-hmm. And so when I spoke with him, like, other people would only email me. I'm like, why can't you pick? And, I mean, this is before everybody was carrying a smartphone around, too. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, like, pick up the phone. Do you know that people it's- now say that they have a condition that is, like, some kind of anxiety condition that is, like, fear of talking on the phone? And that they use that as an excuse to not – like, I've seen people post this. They're like, oh, yeah, this is a thing, like, anxiety about talking on the phone. This is why I can't pick up the phone and talk to you. And I can only do text messages. And I'm like, come uh, on. And then they do voice to text. And you yeah. can understand half the things that they're saying. Like, could have picked up the phone. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. Like, sometimes I don't want to get caught in a conversation for two fucking hours and I'm busy. And, like, right. it's easier to text something because then it's there. Yeah, yeah. But anyways. Yeah. If you're talking about serious business, like getting into porn, pick up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good advice. You know? Um, yeah. And then I think also at a certain point, like, because I was doing all of these other things while still being in the industry, because I really wanted to do both and I wanted to s- remain doing everything that I wanted to do, I wanted to remain in that position. And at a certain point, um, 
like I did need somebody. I needed an advocate. You know, I needed somebody on my side. And at a certain point, he actually told me, like, I don't know how to deal with these people. Like, this is not my world. Like all the mainstream? Yeah. Yeah. And he was honest about it. Yeah. Which I really, really respect because so many people are not. Right. They they fake it. Yeah. And so he he straight up told me. Yeah. I can't do this. Like, I can't handle this. I don't know how. I don't want to mess it up for you. Yeah. Yeah, recognizing so. your limitations is something that people are not very good at. Yeah. Mm-mm. It takes a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so now you're doing a lot of Twitch streaming. Yeah. That's like a big part of your presence online. What has that been like for you? And were you a game player before that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say like hardcore competitive gamer, yeah. but yeah. Um, I love it. Yeah. It's been a huge, it was really difficult in the beginning because there's like all the software that you need to set it up. And I actually yeah. had like a friend of a friend came over and showed me everything. But then like half the stuff they showed me, it was like, okay, that's outdated now. So that's outdated now. And right. So it was a, it was a learning curve and it still is actually, which is cool. Um, it's a little bit intimidating at the beginning because you feel like you're talking to yourself. Yeah. And so that was hard. Like what? And yeah. then you learn, like, okay, so I just have to ramble. I just got to keep the conversation going. Right. Um, and I also started out uh, at the advice of this person that helped me set it up was, like, uh, when you first start, do it sort of on the download. Don't blast it on your social media accounts because mm-hmm. you're going to have problems, like mm-hmm. technological problems, and you don't want 2,000 people to be watching and then something go wrong. And so that was like really good advice. Um, yeah. Mia Malkova actually, she was telling me about how, you know, cause she does a lot of Twitch. Yeah. yeah. Now. We just connected. And she yeah. said that like somebody took all of her fails and made like a compilation on oh, YouTube God. of like all of her mistakes earlier in her Twitch streaming career. Yeah. So, I mean, there's exactly. a perfect example of maybe why you, you start low key. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> actually so I had several people, you, a decade ago, tell me to do streaming, like specifically gaming. Yeah. And at the time I was still in porn. I was doing all these other things and there was a lot going on. Um, a lot of different reports of like girls getting harassed, stalked. I'd already dealt with that shit myself. Mm -hmm. Um, threatened, uh, because they were gamer girls. Mm-hmm. You know, going to conventions and having pro- like issues with their safety. And I was like, I have enough of that in porn. Yeah. I don't need it from another industry. Yeah. Um, but now I feel like it's grown and changed so much mm-hmm. uh, that it, like, it is a good time, at least for me. Maybe yeah. not for everybody, but it was a good time. And I was like, okay. A little bit intimidating at first, getting used to the platform. But now I love it. And it's like. I really love the community that's there. Mm. It's completely different than any form of social media. It kind of reminds me of those MySpace days where I could communicate with fans. Yeah. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a really – so on Twitch, you need moderators because everything's live. Mm-hmm. You have a comment box on the side of your video where people are typing live questions or statements. And, you know, sometimes they're not even talking to you. They're talking to each other. Right. Um and so you need moderators to sort of control that content also because you're, uh, you're responsible. Mm. So like I could be responsible for something else that someone else says, mm-hmm. and then my page can get taken down. Mm-hmm. Right. So you need moderators for several reasons. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have a really, really cool, passionate group that works with me on this mm-hmm. and they look out for me. You know what I mean? And they care. And you feel, I really feel that it's genuine in, yeah. in a way that other social media isn't. Yeah. And like without them, it would definitely be impossible. Yeah. Because you see like you'll see stuff come in and they're boom, delete, boom, banning. You know, like there's a joke in the community like ban hammer. You got to take the ban hammer down to get rid of this person. Yeah. And I also try to keep it uh, much like because I have fans from all over the world, moderators from all over the world. In the beginning, I was letting people speak their own languages. Mm. Um, it's up to you, the streamer, to make that choice. Mm-hmm. So I have, like, moderators from all over the world that speak different languages. And finally, we had to stop doing that because it's 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 too much of a distraction from, like, what's yeah. actually going on. Um, right. And they – sorry, I just lost my train of thought. But 
Oh, one of them said, well, I don't really understand what you mean by this. Like, we developed a list of rules. Like, okay. And you have to take everything with a grain of salt when it comes right. to, like, timing somebody out, which means they just get a break, mm-hmm. a, t- a, t- a literal timeout. Yeah. Or you ban them. And somebody, um, one of my moderators who's not from America was like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, PG-13. How about that? Like, I know the rating systems are not like they are here in Europe, but let's stick with that. Yeah. So we try to maintain, like, a community that is still open-minded because that's important to me. But knowing that there can be kids on this thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. You don't need a bunch of guys on there, like, asking you what the biggest dick you ever exactly. took was. Like, exactly. stuff like that. Because people still, you know, they, yeah. it's like they still can't separate you from the industry. And sure, like, it's fine to talk about sex and you can be – but, like, some people yeah. just take it – to that level, exactly. you're like, dude, that was so unnecessary. It was unnecessary, but also, like, I, it's easy for me to ignore those things. Mm-hmm. They don't really phase me. Right. But again, if it's in the chat and there's a kid watching that. Right. Hey, mommy, who's it? They probably don't say mommy, but hey, mom, hey, dad, who's this? You know, yeah. I don't yeah, want to yeah. I don't want to create unnecessary drama in a community that's, like, so rich with other things. And I always say, like, look, when, you know, at some point we'll do a stream that's 18 and up. And yeah. we'll talk about everything you guys want to talk about. Right. But, like, for now, respect the rules. And it's, like, the one place that I do that and then I have that freedom to do that, mm-hmm. which is nice because it keeps it – like, this is the other thing I say. Keep it relevant. Yeah. Like, let's not talk about what happened yesterday. Let's talk about the now and let's right. talk about tomorrow right. and the future. Right. Or this stupid snake game that I'm playing that I want to crush. You know? like, <laughs> Yeah, I've had a – I went on Twitch for like a little bit. Um, I kind of tried to do it with my podcast and then I just sort oh. of fell – I actually got to the point where I was just about to make like affiliate or whatever. I okay. was like an hour short and then I didn't. It's and a lot I of work. never went back. Yeah, yeah, it's just – it's a lot. And I don't play video games at all. You don't so. have to. There's a lot of people with different things on there. Like yeah. there's people – I do cooking streams sometimes. Another thing that like, – I also – my husband does all the cooking. Oh, I'm nice. Fucking lazy. Oh, well, yeah. I'm not lazy. He's just a really good cook. Oh, that's nice. So he does all the cooking. So we could do live streams where everybody watches him cook. Exactly. And I could comment on it. Exactly. Babe, I, that's I too thought much about salt. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling bloated. Yeah. God, it's my story of my life. <laughs> One of the things that you realize that you recognize when you get older, it's like, no, you're not bloated. You're just fat. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, that's an important, like, thing to arrive at. I remember this lady coming up to me like, you're eating pizza. Why are you eating pizza? Aren't you going to feel bloated later? I was like, no. <laughs> what? Huh? Like if I eat the entire thing, yeah. But huh? <laughs> oh, God. Well, you know, we're all still so obsessed with our weight. True. That was never something that you struggled with, though. No. Actually, the opposite. Yeah. Growing up, yeah. Like, I was tormented. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, like, my mom had to sew, thank God she could sew, but Mm -hmm. she had to, like, sew my pants Mm -hmm. and take them down all the time. Yeah. And I was lanky. So, like, high waters are a thing, but I do not approve. (laughs) Okay. Let me state that for the record. (laughs) Like, my pants were high waters because I was too tall, but too skinny for anything else. Right. So then she would actually have to extend, like, oh, my mom is the sweetest. Like, she would extend my freaking pants until I found, like, the three for 10 shop uh-huh. where I got the polyester bell bottoms. I was like, finally something fits me. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I was uh, always underweight, mm-hmm. always. Um, people always asking me if I was anorexic. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It was something I struggled with as a kid. Um, yeah. Now it's like hormones, aging, ta-da, yeah, I'm I fine. Know. <laughs> I know. Now you're like, oh, worry about it. perfect. Yeah. Now you're like, it's yeah. perfect. Yeah, it all worked out for you for the rest of us. And hey, you know, now it's like working, talk about working out. Like you have on the flip side, genetics. Like, yeah, at least I got that going from you. Yeah, yeah, totally. (laughs) Thankful for that. Totally. Do you work out? I do, but I go through waves. Like, I'm not a beast, I'm not a gym beast Mm -hmm. by any means. Um, What do you do? Like, they have really boring. I hate the gym. I hate it. Yeah. I feel good once I do it, but I really have to force myself. Mm-hmm. to get up and do it. Yeah. Um, but I'll do like the elliptical and then yeah. switch it up different days of the week with weights and um, exercises. I really love Pilates. I just don't do it a lot. Mm-hmm. Like the one with the actual machines. Yeah. I should get back into that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've accepted the fact that I have to take classes and have someone yell at me because I won't, I won't, I'll go yeah. and I won't 
do enough and yeah. at 20 minutes I'll be like I'm done and like it's just like I have to have that structure I loved that when class pass first started and then mm. it became lame I was like yeah goodbye yeah you suck now <laughs> <laughs> um well I mean I've had you for over an hour so oh. I feel like I should let you go though I'm sad um we'll look at what time it is afterwards what time is it actually it's uh, 15 after 1 Oh, already. Whoa, time yeah. flies. Yeah. Time flies I know, I know when you're you having have, fun. Yeah, I know you have to go. So um, can you tell – well, first of all, thank you so much for coming of on. Of course, yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. I so appreciate it. It's it my was pleasure. really good to see you. Yeah, you too. And can you tell everybody where they can find you on social media? Any plugs that you want to plug? Any Surely. projects? All that stuff. As always, uh, my website, which is horribly maintained, SashaGray.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook – and VK for my Russians out there, at Sasha Gray everywhere. There are no private profiles. Do you get a lot of, of that fishing? So much. Yeah. I actually had. Nah, I don't want to talk about that because I don't want to like out him. But yeah, like there was. I'll just say briefly, somebody like conned out of money, a lot of money, and this, Twitter still has not removed the profile. Yeah, this yeah. happens to girls all the time. Yeah, all the time. So, it's insane. Be careful out there. Yeah, and Twitch, of course. At Sasha Gray. Um, yeah, doing all that. Working on new music, working on uh, a new photo series. So a lot to. A lot coming up. A lot to move forward with. Awesome. Yeah. And you guys can find me, as always, at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can download this on all podcast platforms Apple Podcasts, oh, yeah. iHeartRadio, Spotify fucking stitcher soundcloud we're everywhere everywhere <laughs> every podcast platform um actually the audio downloads help me a lot not that you can't watch us on youtube but also like audio platforms is is very is very helpful for me um and then facebook facebook.com slash holly randall unfiltered and obviously my patreon patreon.com slash holly randall unfiltered thank you guys so much for watching or listening see you next time <laughs>